This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. Chris Graham and my co-host every Friday is Jerry Carter. And uh, we're going to talk some college football news. You know, it's, we're in between the, uh, the, se- you know, the regular season and the, uh, uh, the postseason. I guess there's still one more game, Army-Navy. You can't overlook army Navy, sir. I can't do that. Uh, we all, all of us have military ties. My grandfather fought in the Army. I've watched this game every year. One day I'm going to go to it. Uh, but uh, still got Army-Navy. But we're going to talk other college football. And, Jerry, let's start with a school that you have a tie to through your, your daughter, Serena, a graduate of Liberty University. Liberty University, as we're recording this podcast, they're about an hour and a half away from rolling out Hugh Freeze, the former Ole Miss coach, so SEC former head coach, is going to be announced as the new head football coach at Liberty University. Now, you can be of a lot of minds on this. You know, first, first impression could be, wow, SEC coach is coming to Liberty? There's a there's a downside there perhaps too, but I wanted to get your thoughts, Jerry. We haven't even discussed this at all, so I don't know what you're thinking. But as a guy with with you know close ties to Liberty University through your daughter, uh, what are your thoughts about this hire? Uh, the first thing I want to do, uh, Chris, is say thank you to Turner Gill. I, I thought that Turner Gill did an outstanding job at a at a tough place. And, uh, you know, we had talked a little bit about, you know, his reasons for stepping down. And it's, so the first thing I want to do is say thank you to Turner Gill. Now you bring up the conversation about uh, Hugh Freeze. This goes back, Chris, to what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, about not everybody gets their next chance. Yeah. Not everybody gets that next chance. And if you want the next chance, you have to take it where it comes and it's a situation i i again it, it even the tie with it being old miss david cutcliffe gets his first head coaching job at old miss it doesn't it doesn't work out was the duke job a desirable job to take absolutely not it's just it, it was arguably the worst program in north america but you have to take the second job winning where you can now, what Liberty has done is they just completed Chris, the, trans- the transfer from the FCS to the FBS. And I'm glad that Turner was able to get them through that. And that was, Robert Hall always had a dream of having big time sports teams. And they've had some success, but not anything that would resemble next level uh, success down there. Women's basketball program, probably as successful as they've been. They, a few years back, they had a Sweet 16 run. And it's a situation to where I, I think that it's a good setup. And I think that Liberty could, uh, could make some progress going forward with a big game coach. So Hugh Free now. So the Hugh Freeze. So he's an Ole Miss guy, and he has success at Ole Miss. Uh, he when he took over 2011, the season before he took over, they'd won two games. They had lost 14 straight in the SEC and had won two games total in 2011. He took them to four straight bowls. Uh, in 2015, had them uh, at, at 10 wins. They played in the uh, in, in the uh, uh, Sugar Bowl. Lost the Sugar Bowl game, but they played in the Sugar Bowl that year. Last the last season was a come down year. They won five games. Uh, and then he was let go, and then the last two years, Ole Miss has been on probation. Uh, some of the fallout of the Hugh Freeze era. And then, of course, the embarrassing detail here was that in the process of, oh, you know, SEC football can get ugly. Uh, we all know this. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dirty place. Uh, but Houston Nutt, who Hugh Freeze had replaced at Ole Miss, uh, sued the school and sued Hugh Freeze because uh, he was alleging that that they were throwing him under the bus, uh, that the problems that had popped up during the freeze era, that he was trying to say that they were trying to put those problems on Houston Nutt. And, of course, Houston Nutt had gone from Ole Miss to Arkansas, and he's, he's since been let go there. Uh, that's been a while now. Uh, but uh, uh, he was he, – so he sued and, and, and was trying to say, stop bad-mouthing me. And in the process of that lawsuit, it comes out that – that Hugh Freeze had been making phone calls with his university-issued phone to an escort servers, and that there were numerous phone calls dating back to the very beginning of his tenure at Ole Miss. So that's that's not why he got fired. That's an embarrassing detail, uh, and it's one that you know part of your reputation is going to be reclaimed. 
Now, he also, more significantly than that, I mean, that's embarrassing, that's, that's, but that's not, again, why he got fired. Uh, because of the NCAA violations at Ole Miss that led to the bowl ban in the last two seasons, uh, if Hugh Freeze had been hired anywhere as, as a head coach or an assistant coach in the NCAA, he would have had to serve a two-game suspension uh, at the start of whatever tenure that would be. That was only a two-year penalty. That time's up now. Uh, that said, he was a hot prospect out there again, Hugh Freeze. He, uh, the reports today, uh, he had been in the last week or so linked to offensive coordinator positions open at Tennessee, at Auburn, at Florida State. Earlier this year, Alabama had made overtures towards hiring him uh, in, in an a, a advisory role, you know, one of those special assistant roles that Nick Saban loves to have on his staff. So when you're talking about Auburn, Alabama, Tennessee, Florida State saying, we want you here, that means he was back within the graces of college football, and now he's at Liberty. So, I, you know, it's interesting, uh, Jerry. All that I said there, uh, you know, there's, there's pluses, there's minuses, but... I mean, he was in demand, and so it makes me think that, uh, you know, he was going somewhere. I'm kind of surprised he's at Liberty, given all those other possibilities that are out there. Well, some of the things you have to look at, and it ties back into the you know, situation this week, Chris, where JMU has, uh, has lost their coach. I, I remember just a few years back, James Madison, uh, at the time we were uh, involved in their athletic department, and they first started talking about making the jump. And they sent out letters and saying, hey, if we really want to go to the next level, we have to do this, 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 this to be able to do this. And they kind of got hung up in a holding pattern. Where in that same time frame, you look at Old Dominion and Charlotte, two schools that were in a situation where they're just saying, hey, instead of thinking about this or overthinking about it, why don't we just jump in? Do first and go straight to the where we want to be and then figure out how to be successful there. And in a sense, it, it kind of left you, James Madison behind the behind the curve, if you will. And that's how you end up losing uh, a quality coach like they did, you know, this, this past week or the past week and a half. The thing about Liberty is Liberty is, is now completed the transfer. They are at the top level. Money... It's never been an issue down there. And again, if it's a situation from a standpoint of, again, knowing more about Liberty and how it's set up. So I'm not surprised by the, the aggressive move. Maybe if there's a question, see, there is a, a questionable pass there. But I think that Liberty has a chance to, to make some noise here. But again, it comes down to what's your definition of making noise. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you, from, to me, from a football perspective and from an athletics perspective, program perspective, this is a home run hire. In fact, I wrote a column, and that was the headline, home run hire. But I've got to ask you, Jerry, now, and, and, and you wear so many different hats when it comes to sports. We often talk about as much about the sports as we, we'll talk about the, the kids and, and how they do in school and, and how they do in life and all that. Other. So now I've got to ask you, and again, you're a, you're a Liberty parent. You're a Liberty alum parent. All right, so not only Hugh Freeze and the uh, not not and not just the NCAA violations, which are, are a concern, I would think would be a concern to some degree. The the whole embarrassing stuff with the escort. Ian McCall, the new athletics director. I say new; he's been there for a couple of years now. But of course, he was in Baylor presiding over that train wreck at the end of that process with Art Bryles and, and the cover-ups of terrible stuff going on at Baylor. So I say all that. How do you, I mean, as a Liberty alum parent, how do you feel? Not just about the football part of this, but, I mean, there are people out there throwing stones right now at Liberty saying you're you're throwing your mission under the bus to win football games. What do you, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Chris, it, it's a situation for, from a standpoint of there are so many people out there that there are question marks about. And let's go back to the old Miss situation for a second. And this ties into this year where uh, Patterson, um, the quarterback, he was able to petition the NCAA and get into a situation where he was eligible to play for Michigan this year. And that was based on, his argument was that old Miss lied to him 
up off the level of dirt blocks. So it, it's kind of funny to debate how what all they did or did not do down there at a school. But the personal standpoint, that is a that is a unique situation as far as the uh, you know the cell phone issues. That's not a that's not as much of a he said she said as it is something that was actually proven. And it, it's going to be interesting from a standpoint to see how people warm up to that. Now, there are people who will tell you, hey, if you win, you're fine. If you if you don't win, then that's going to be the first thing that somebody's going to say is, look, this is, this is who we hired. This is what we've got. Let's just go on to the next person. So I think where he's previous concern, he's in a situation to where I and mean, that's not that's not how necessarily I feel, but I think the general perception is going to be: Hey, if he comes down there and he wins, a lot of those people are just going to say, "Okay, well, the guy deserves a second chance." Yeah, Bobby Petrino was in that same boat, and I don't. And what's interesting about Petrino was, of course, he you know in Louisville, we, 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 and we talked about Petrino in Louisville a lot the last few weeks on our podcast here. Uh, but, you know, it's not like it, his second run in Louisville that it was personal issues that brought him down. It was football issues that brought him down, right? It was that he couldn't win football games this year. But, you know, na- but it reminds you of the personal issues <laughs> that, that that were at play. And um, and so, yeah, you know, I've, winning, winning, winning is the ultimate uh, cure. Uh, I'm trying to think of the Bill Parcells' exact quote on that. But winning is the ultimate disinfectant, I think, what Parcells uh, used to say. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, I, I, I know – now, I have no ties of liberty. Uh, we cover them uh, actively, closely. Uh, they're – and I'm from, from a pure uh, coverage standpoint and, and w- looking at what they're doing athletically, they are doing lots of great things. I mean, they, you know, they're obviously, they're putting a lot of money into it. They've gone from the FCS level to FBS level. They made that transition seamlessly. They won six games this year. Uh Turner Gill did a great job. Turner Gill was a different person, too. Turner Gill was an upstanding, upright, I mean, you know, solid person. And I'm not saying Hugh Freeze is, is just the devil or anything else, but they do stand out in contrast in terms of their, their personal approach to life. And, and Gill's not there not because he didn't win football games. It's because his wife has a serious heart condition, and he says, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm successful, and in fact, Liberty University, uh, Ian McCall said he was going to offer him a multi-year contract extension after this season. He thought that the things were going in a great direction. Gill's 56 years old. He's got this program moving in the right direction. I want him here for the long term. And then he steps down not for football reasons, not for anything else, but for family reasons. And so, you know, that, that's where it is now. But, you know, I guess I, I, I put, you know, I kind of put this in a lens for me of being a UVA alum and in my school. I would, I would probably from – even even looking at Hugh Freeze's success and and what he might mean to that program, and I think he, he's going to win football games. There. I don't think there's any question. He's going to win football games at Liberty. Uh, but I, you know, if it was my school, I'd probably I'd probably be a little reluctant to embrace it. Uh, second chances, yes, but maybe somewhere else would be my approach if it was my school. So I'm I'm of a lot of different minds on that. He will win football games there, but I just wonder at what price. Well, that, that goes back to the question of every time a coaching just tire is made in major college football, you have to ask yourself, who all uh, applied for the job? Who all are they looking at? And if, let's just say, William and Mary hires Hugh Freeze, that's, that's one story. But this isn't William and Mary. This is Liberty University. And... Liberty University is one of those rare schools where it was built and, and raised off of the fundamental you know, beliefs. And it, it's, a, it's a unique situation. I, the fact that Hugh Freeze has gotten another job does not surprise me at all. The fact that Hugh Freeze got that job at Liberty University, yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a little surprised by that. I, I felt like they could have Go back for just a second, Chris. When Louisville didn't get their guy, the question was, well, who, who was going to take it now? Who was going to take it? Well, once the dust settled, I think they got a pretty good guy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. I, so he's there. The, the, good guys, the good guys are there. 
And he did a phenomenal job at App State. I think he's going to do a nice job in the ACC. So it's one of those things from a football standpoint, the decision makes sense from a Liberty University standpoint. I'm not as sure. And, and one other aspect to this, and then we'll talk some other stuff, but I, I, I don't know that we'll even know this number because Liberty is a private university, so they're not required to release these details. Public schools you have to let you have to let us know. You know, we can file FOI requests if we have to to find out what coaches get paid. But Liberty, being a private school, is not subjected to that. But I would love to know what he's getting paid there. And I say it for this reason because he was again up for jobs. I mean, he was talked about at least. Let's just say it that way. By uh, as an offensive coordinator at schools like Florida State, Tennessee, Auburn, Alabama. I looked this up. SEC guys, SEC guys particularly. You're talking about a million plus for coordinators now. You know, it's not like, I mean, at, at, at Virginia, Robert Ane, the offensive coordinator, uh, he's getting paid. It was just under six hundred thousand dollars this year, which you know, for the average person, that's a lot of money. But in, in the business, it's it's not a lot. But you know, there are SEC coordinators making two million plus. I'm not saying Hugh Freeze would have made two million plus, but if he's at Auburn or Tennessee, he's making a million plus. And I don't know that Liberty's – I mean, maybe I guess Liberty is paying a million plus. I would love to know that number because for me – I mean, you know, to me also I will say Hugh Freeze at, as a coordinator at an SEC school, you don't even have that question. If, if he's at Auburn, oh, my God, Auburn has a million different things to worry about other than Hugh Freeze calling escorts. I mean, they got Bruce Pearl as their head basketball coach. Um, they've got so many other things that are way above Hugh Freeze. But it kind of stands out at Liberty. So, yeah, I, I would love to see this. And I, and I guess I hope for Liberty's sake, and I don't know this will be the case, because is Hugh Freeze kind of going to use this as a stepping stone to reclaim his reputation, kind of like Petrino did at Western Kentucky for two or three years, and, and use this as a stepping stone to get a job somewhere else? I guess I would hope for Liberty that they would have a long-term guy. Maybe he will be that guy. But I do have to question that because – just because he is a, you know, he, he was being looked at by these big name SEC schools. So money and how long he's going to be there, there'd be two big questions I'd have too. Well, Chris, let's tie in two other thoughts to the, the coaching and the mentality that goes and gets involved in it. And the first one, I want to go back to something we've talked about in the past, uh, Chubby Smith. Now, when you talk, at, and the other one will be Lane Kiffin. You know, but Chubby Smith and Rick Pitino, and were let go roughly the same the same time frame. And Patino went on and on and on and on and on about how he wants to coach, he wants to coach, he'll coach anywhere, he'll he just wants to coach. I never believed that. I never believe I never believed that Rick Patino was going to take the job at Niagara. Yeah, you know, where Tubby Smith did what? I mean Tubby Smith went all the way back to his roots and Tubby Smith truly feels like he still has something to give the game. And it's not about it's not about the bright lights. Right? He's probably gonna be coaching in front of the smallest crowd he's ever he's ever coached in front of, you know, coaching at high point. Yeah. And the, the same scenario that you talked about about the SEC coordinators. And again, Maryland just hired uh Alabama's offensive coordinator. Yeah. But so when Lane Kiffin left and took the job that he took. Everybody's like, oh, there's no way he's going to stay there. There's, there's no way he's going to stay there. You know, it's, just, it's a stepping stone. There's no way he's going to stay there. And, and he had some amazing success. And then came, and they were talking to him at the end of the year. And he said, he said, for me, it's never been about the TV. It's about wearing the headset. You know, I don't have to have that next level job. He goes, I just... I want to have a headset on. I want to work with these kids. Now, I was just gullible enough to believe that. Now, he's still there. He's still there. And I think, I, I hope for his sake that he is there because, you know, it, it, it's good for a school to have continuity. So we'll, we'll see how long his breeze is there. And if he's not there long term, I think that, I think the situation looks worse. For yeah, yeah. So well, that'll that'll all play out, and we're talking about all this, and we're still. I mean, as we're recording this, this is still over an hour away from Liberty formally announcing him, but the word is out there everywhere. So, um, but it's 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 obviously huge news and a huge hire. I I, I cannot over, uh, overstate that a huge hire for Liberty that Hugh Freeze will be the head football coach. So let's switch gears, and uh, 
and, and I'm almost distressed to learn that uh, I was apparently so persuasive in our, our our arguments last week, Jerry, back and forth about uh, bowls and ACC and everything else, that apparently I've turned you against the ACC. Uh, I might be overstating that, but uh, uh, you, you you were telling me you have some different thoughts about the ACC's 2018 season. Tell me tell me what you're thinking. Well, when you look at the, the old uh, the glass is half empty, the glass is half full thing, and when your entire league is lumped together with the same the same record, basically, you're sitting there and you're going, it's not that we're down. We're not down. We're we're just uber competitive. We're just, you know, it's balanced. It's balanced. Well, when you start looking at the individual teams, and I'll start out, I'll, I'll start out with Duke. Uh, you know, Duke went out and they played and went seven and five. Okay, well, what was their best win? If you go, if you go through it, if you go through it, Chris, Duke's best win this year, I would argue, was beating Army. Our Army came out and had a ten and two season, and their two losses were to Oklahoma in overtime and to Duke. So now yeah, let's take a look. See, hey, we're seven and five. We're going to a bowl, but who did we who did we play? Who did we beat? Now, in that same thought, let's let we'll tell you answer the next. UVA went seven and five, and tell me who was who was UVA's best best win? Oh, are you asking? I I I uh, hadn't really thought about who the best win was. Uh, uh, what I was because I don't think they had a great win this year. I would say that their their best the best feature was they had one double digit loss and they were in every game. So, uh, but yeah, they didn't they didn't have a great schedule. That's that's the big thing for UVA. Looking at their schedule real quick. Uh, let's see, their best win, and I'm just looking at the ESPN FPI, uh, let's see, Indiana was 62, they lost that game, they beat Ohio at 58, uh, Miami at 21, as an FPI, but uh, Miami finished 75 this year, Duke was 50, Pitt was 51 when they lost to Pitt, so yeah, they, they, they didn't really play a great schedule. Uh, I guess your best loss was NC State, and your best win was Miami. So not not a lot of impressive, impressiveness in any, any direction there. Well, and you go through, and you, you go through each school in that situation. The only one that doesn't look that way, uh, obviously other than Clemson and Notre Dame, and I do count Notre Dame as ACC, Syracuse, because they go 9-3. and three. And their, their two losses... Two of the three losses were to a team that's playing in the playoffs. I, I, I believe they're the only team in the country that can say that. That they lost both to Notre Dame and to Clemson, and then they they stepped up and uh, had a misstep, if you will, and lost to Pitt. So here, so you could actually say that Syracuse went through a year very quietly and took care of business and had a had, had a nice year. And I was happy to see them get to go to Orlando. And so it's not, it, it's not all of a sudden that you're thinking, hey, it's a bad league. It was a down year. You just take, you take those things. And we just used the Duke and UVA example. We should go right there. We should go right down the line. But Boston College, hey, Boston College did a whole lot better. Well, at the end of the year, they were 7-5. Pitt was one of the major anomalies. I did come in and, and hit the poster child for Central Florida. Yeah, you know, Central Florida. Oh, they didn't play anybody. They didn't play anybody. They they played who they could schedule, and when they played Pitt, they I, I think the margin was four touchdowns. Yeah, they just they just they embarrassed Pitt. Forty-five points. And was it Pitt? Yeah. And Pitt also <laughs> lost to Penn State fifty-one to six. So I mean, that's a two prominent. Big blowout losses for a team who played in your championship game. Correct. So it, it's a situation to where now I joked about all the teams at seven and five. Well, in actuality, and in actuality, it became it became seven and six, and they did have they did have some solid wins, and they did do really well in the ACC. So it's it just it was a matter of just taking some reflection and. I'm always going to be an ACC homer. I don't, I don't hide from that. And it's a situation to where it's like when you're watching your children play, you're like, okay, are we really good because I love who's out there? 
Uh, and I guess the league, in actuality, did have a down year. You, you look at, uh, you know, Wake Forest might be a little bit on the rise. They had, uh, they had the had book in wins where they beat uh, the up to NC State in Raleigh. And then they just, they just thumped. They thumped, too. Now, in between those two, in between those two, they played senior day against Pitt and lost by, by 30 points. So you're, you're sitting there, it was, we can call it balanced. We can talk about the glass being half full, but the reality is it would be just as easy to say the glass was half in. We had a, we had teams in the league that had good days. I, it didn't make any sense. I mean, the pit, pit would turn around and they, they just spanked Wake on senior day. Then they go down and play Miami. Because I don't think Miami had won a meaningful ball game in what seemed like two months. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you know, and then Miami comes out. Miami makes Pitt look like a bad football team. And it's going to be something to where we'll see how the bowls shake out. But when they when they did the bowl bits, you know, there's 40 bowl bits. 20 minutes after it started, 31, there's 31 of the 40 bowl bits had been announced. Okay, of the nine that were not, eight of them involved the ACC. And they just literally couldn't figure out who matched with who and how and how we could get you know sell some seats, how we could be past competitive bowl games. And you ended up in a situation, for example, towards the bottom, you know, Annapolis gets the pick before Shreveport. So who's in Annapolis? A six and six Virginia Tech team. And Dukes and Shreveport at seven and five. And the argument that was made for the fact that Virginia Tech will sell more seats uh, in Annapolis than they would in Shreveport because of their fan base. Well, that argument might have made sense, but what were you do? You were the one convincing me that two weeks ago, Virginia Tech was playing a home game against UVA, mm-hmm. and there were 10,000 empty seats. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's kind of interesting in the fact that yeah, I, uh, you know Georgia Tech's in the situation to where now their number one guy that they were looking for, I think, is backed out. So the question now will become who will take over that program. Uh, so you're going to have a new coach at North Carolina. You're going to have a new coach at Louisville. You're going to have a new coach at Georgia Tech. And you're going to have a bunch of teams trying to bounce back from, from bad years. Like next year, it's going to be really interesting, and I think the, the bowl season will be interesting as well. But it just it wasn't until the dust settled and you started looking at how I've been making the case for you know, a month now. Hey, we're not down. We're just balanced. Well, I think the word I would use now is just inconsistent. It's just that the, the majority of the teams in the league are just incredibly inconsistent. Well, and I'm looking too, as you were talking, it made me think it's something I hadn't looked up closely, but and, and the numbers bear it out. ESPN does, uh, among others, but I'm, I'm looking at theirs right now. Uh, I, I, it, it, we're used to power rankings for individual teams, but they do a, a, a conference power rankings as well, kind of weighting how all those teams play out and then how, how it weighs out from a conference by conference perspective. And among the power five, the ACC was a distant fit this year. Uh, and that was consistent all through the season. So, and, and a way to judge that is, is fair. I, I, I was thinking along the same lines, Jerry, as you. Uh, it, it, you look at when you are in conference play and you're beating each other up week to week, you know, it, it's hard to judge from there because you're playing each other, but you have to look outside of the conference. And I would argue, actually, that for, for me, Duke's most impressive win was probably Northwestern. Even though Army finished 10-2, and two, they played a weaker schedule. They did lose to Oklahoma. That's a good game. They lost to them close. But uh, from a power rankings perspective, Northwestern was 41st, and, and Army was in the 60s in the power rankings. But both of those are impressive wins, so I won't you know, necessarily look at one and say one was necessarily that much better than the other. I would say Northwestern, they played the Big Ten championship game. But those are – now, those are two great wins, you know, in, in, a, in, in the context of the ACC this year because – from a non-conference perspective, because you look at the rest of the ACC outside of Clemson. And you're mentioning it, Jerry uh, – you know, pit your a team that played in your championship game last Saturday night. Two huge, ugly losses 
to not exactly team. You know, I guess I mean Central Florida was in the mix there at their number eight in the old, the final uh, college playoff rankings, and they're going to be in a New Year's Day bowl game. But you lose forty five fourteen to them. You lose fifty one to six to Penn State, a team that was not in the mix for anything after about October fifteenth. Uh, and then you know there's nothing else in terms of impressive non conference wins. Um, even even when you start looking at Clemson, I mean, you know, they they struggled and to, to beat a Texas A and M team that was sort of a mid middle of the pack uh, SEC school this year. Uh, I know that was before the quarterback change, but still, that was the result of that game. And so, yeah, when you when you t- take our show on the road outside of conference, we didn't show this year. Not like the basketball program show. The football programs did not do the do the work this year. So, yeah, it's uh. It's uh, you know we we had a lot of balance uh, a lot of mediocre teams maybe would, would would be the balance there, and uh, the only thing I can say though Jerry is I'm sorry I brought you down man because we were feeling good last week. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, and yet you know, I watched every second of the football stuff. Uh, I think it was like seven straight hours, four on the one network and three on the other. And the Syracuse coach, which is really he's really impressed me this year. And uh, he was talking about what it means to win 10 games in a season. And, and he's doing the math, and he's saying that basically, Chris, you have an opportunity to win 10 games in a season, an average of once per recruiting class. So every, every four years, in, in his mind, you know, unless you're one of the cream to the cream, that's what you're shooting for. You're trying to win 10 games. So I'll, I'll definitely be keeping an eye on the Syracuse game when they play their bowl game down in Orlando. And you know, that's where the decision started. Of course, they had to decide, do we send NC State in its 9-3, and three, or do we, do we send Syracuse in its 9-3? and three? Well, again, Syracuse, two of their losses were to Final Four teams. And NC State uh, was a home favored by three touchdowns and lost the Wake Forest. Right? So I'm glad that Syracuse got the nod, and I'll be pulling for Syracuse to get 10 wins. But the little the part of me that has grown up as a ACC basketball fan has always taken a offense to being told that we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not a football conference. So it's like getting picked on as a little kid when you're in junior high school. I feel like that the, the ACC, I, I was you know, kind of bummed that we only split with the Big Ten this year in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. And you're, you're sitting there, if it's from a football standpoint, Clemson is carrying the load, and Syracuse had a nice, a nice season, and NC State had some success. But after that, you just have a, a bunch of teams that beat each other up and uh, both Virginia and Duke, the two schools that you know, we follow closely, uh, both of us had a chance the last week for what I think I would have called the signature win. I, I think if Virginia beats Virginia Tech, now you're eight and four. You're eight and four. You knock the bully off the mountain, and you're going to a, a, a solid bowl game. In Duke's case, you know, you, if you handle Wake Forest, you go eight and four, you separate yourself out, and then you have a chance at a nine-win season. And obviously, Virginia came a whole lot closer to taking care of their than Duke did. But seven and five, you just got to go hope you go to your bowl game. You hope you can take advantage of another uh, another three weeks of practice. And the other thing, Chris, you got to factor in, and I, I don't follow the NFL the way that most people do. I do follow the players from the schools that go into the NFL. So you're in a situation, one of the things, like a young man who's trying to go, people talking basketball, hey, I'm going to go play for Paul Parry in Kentucky if he knows how to get me ready for the NFL. So you're in a situation to where these schools that are trying to get, take a UVA or a Duke or a, a Wake Forest, teams that are in the middle of the road that are trying to get better, how many skilled position players do they currently have in the NFL? I'm not asking you to actually try to name them all, but there was a stretch back in UVA's heyday where there was two or three UVA quarterbacks bouncing around. 
you had some whiteouts. You had some whiteouts bouncing around. You know, uh, Duke had 12 players uh, in the NFL this year, and the five that have the most name recognition ended up on the IR. Uh, even Jamison Crowder has, has been in and out of the lineup with the Redskins due to some injuries. So you're in a situation to where every time if you just take a look at, let's say, the University of Georgia, immediately you see Green, you see Gurley, you see Stafford, you see the two rookie running backs. You're just, you know, it, it's the same thing about when you're trying to get to that level. Clemson, for example, we know that their entire defensive front seven is going to get drafted this year. So that's what it's going to take. And you can, you know, speak on that from you know, through Bronco's eyes and say, you and I had the conversation at the beginning of the year when he, he sounded like he was saying, hey, our players aren't that good. Um, and I was distraught when he said it, but I, I understand what he said. You know, Clemson, there was no doubt in my mind that Clemson was just going to dump truck pit in the, uh, in the game because Clemson's just that much better. So what does Virginia do to get to the next level? What does Duke do to get to the next level? How is it different from what Liberty is going to try to do? But it's going to be fun watching going forward, but I I did have to stop after, you know, six or seven weeks of saying, arguing the point out in my mind, saying, we're not down, we're not down, we're just competitive. But then I started looking at the schedule saying, who did we beat? Where where, where, where did the wins come from? Who, who took care of it outside of the, you know, outside of the conference? I was going to ask a question. You mentioned um, um, when you started talking about bowl games, it made, the thought came to my mind was, well, for both Duke and Virginia and for the other schools who are playing in games that are not college football playoff, you look at your bowl game as an opportunity to get better for next year. Uh, practice the next couple of weeks, and then you play your game, and hopefully you have a springboard the next year. UVA did not have that last year. The military bowl was a 49-7 beatdown, uh, and it was uh, sort of a – a come to Jesus moment a little bit for Bronco Mendenhall. But Carla Williams was not happy with that uh, that performance in her, when her first you know major event as the new athletics director at UVA at that time. So, but you want to springboard, you want to play good, you want to play well, you want to build to the future. And so I'm thinking, hi, UVA Bryce Perkins gets you know a bowl game, he gets a chance to get a little better. Uh, and then I'm thinking Daniel Jones at Duke. Uh, he's 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 a junior. He can come back next year. But there is so much buzz about him. Because he's coached by David Cutcliffe, who is a quarterback guru, uh, that he would be a first-round pick in the draft if he came out this year. Uh, he's got all the intangibles, uh, big kid, strong arm, coached by Cut. Uh, what do you think, Jerry, uh, if you were a betting man? Is he going to stay at Duke or is he going to go to the NFL? Well, one of the things that – if you look back to the point where uh, things kind of got off track – it's right after a, the Monday night game, an NFL game, and there was kind of a blowout type thing, and you're looking for things to talk about. And Kuyper had uh, came out and said that Jones was number two on his quarterback board. That was number, he was number two on his quarterback board. And I'm sitting there, so I bet that blew me away. And I remember, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the other guy's game that does the same job, not Kuyper, but... Oh, uh, I see him, uh, see his face and listen to him talk, and he goes, yeah. He actually, he, he said he had Jones at six on his quarterback board. How much time did he say? And it, yes, yeah. And, and it was a situation to where he's, and he joked about Kuyper just looking to make a splash, and he said what he said what he did. But going back to the Clemson game, Jones was hurt in the Clemson game. And Jones tried to tried to play through it. The amount of tape they had wrapped around um, wrapped around his foot was unbelievable. And then they heard him again in the game, and the kid wanted to keep he wanted to keep playing. He was in the situation to where they finally did take him out at the end. He, did, he ended up not playing the fourth quarter. But Jones is in a situation, Chris. That Hey, it's kind of like the old jokes about, you know, Dean Smith had all these great players, and they said the only person that could hold Michael Jordan under 20 points a game was Dean Smith. And Jones, I, I, I don't know what Jones would do 
if he could play behind an NFL line. In other words, Jones doesn't get a chance to throw a lot of routes that would be thrown, timing routes in situations. If you look back over the past five years, the biggest weakness that Duke's had, and then it will be for a long time, is their offensive line. They've had a couple of players come through and are playing in the NFL now. But as a whole, Jones, they, they keep having to throw so many these little slants, these little, you know, throw it out to the, to, you know, to the edge and hope somebody breaks the tackle to where that he's, because he's, most of the time, he's running for his life. But in that situation, in that situation, he can run. Right? He, to me, I'm not, he, you're not going to mistake him for Lamar Jackson. But he is, he's a very effective, you know, uh, rushing with the ball and making plays. So to see how good Jones could be, if you put him behind, uh, we sat down when it was time to watch the Thompson game. I told them, I said, hey, all we're trying to do here is not have Jones get broken. Yeah. And in the, in the Wake Forest game, um, the, Wake, the, 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 the Wake Forest game, again, he was still hurt. He was trying to play through it. And he's in a situation to where he's had some moments where he's looked really, really good. He's had some phenomenal games. He came back for two weeks, two games after breaking his collarbone. So obviously, the young man's tough. I just, I was surprised when Kuiper said to Todd McShay, I knew the name would come to me, said, yeah, six or seven. And you're in a situation to where I kind of hope he comes back. But that's, that's, self, that's being selfish and, and, and the fact that cause he, he would be the first time he's, he's got the prototype build. He's got the, uh, you know, the Peyton Manning type build, you know, where Thad Lewis had a really nice run in the cut clip, but he couldn't shake the fact that he was 5'11". So I think Jones can play at the next level, and I think it would help the program for him to play at the next level. Yeah, we've had four quarterbacks go open, and uh, Free, uh was uh, Matty Ice's backup in Atlanta for a few years. Uh, Brad Lewis, obviously, we had some starts throughout the, the NFL, different teams in different cities. Um, Anthony Boone uh, has, has bounced around a little bit. But being in a situation where it would help the program if somebody could come up and and see him play on television and not, not just hold the clipboard on television. And that's one of the things I, I remember back where UVA was concerned. Being in a situation to where you're going to have to help me out, but I wanted to say there was like three or four straight quarterbacks. Uh, I, I know Schaub was in there. Um, uh, Aaron Brooks would have been probably a guy right before Schaub. Um and then before Aaron Brooks, uh, you would have had Matt Blunden, but it was a little bit before Brooks. Uh, and then uh, Sean Moore held a clipboard for a long time in the NFL. So did Blunden. Brooks started for the in, in the NFL for quite a long time. New Orleans Saints uh, was the team he really played for a long time with. Um, and so yeah, they and and, and Schaub had a, a really nice run for several years with the Texans before you know now he's he's been a, a backup for a while. But uh, but yeah, there was a run of those guys uh, there for for. You know, over about a 20-year period, you had guys representing about 10 or 11 or 12 years of UVA football who who had nice runs in the NFL afterwards. Well, the uh, the, the school out here that you know, follow that had a, a similar run and actually led the led the league in quarterbacks uh, had made it to the NFL. Was UW had a run where Washington sent, I believe it was nine or ten straight quarterbacks again, all different level of success, but. You're in a situation to where, you know, you had Warren Moon. You had uh, Mark Brunel. You had uh, both of the Hewitt brothers. You had uh, Bill Johor. So what's your school gets a reputation of, hey, I've been state forever. Chris was what? They were linebacker you. Yeah. So you're, you're in a situation. I, I love David Cutcliffe, and, and people call him things like the quarterback whisperer and of course, everybody knows about his success with Peyton and Eli. I think it would really give Duke a chance. It would give Duke a chance if somebody came out of school 
and successfully plays in the NFL. Uh, and yes, Ed Lewis had a he had a he had a good flirtation with it for four or five years, and I enjoyed that. But I would rather see Daniel Jones come back. I'd like to see him play another year, and then go in and be somebody who can actually play at that at that level. Yeah, I'll say this. I was going to say, with my thoughts on Daniel Jones, uh, I look at the, the various rankings, and I see him rank anywhere from the top two or three. Now, some of the rankings I see don't list juniors. They don't list people who have not declared. So, uh, But he clearly would be in that mix. I'm, most of what I'm reading as we're talking here, just a quick glance I get on Google when we're, we're going back and forth, is that if he came out, he would be a first or second round pick at worst. Uh, unless we discover something somehow, you know, in a process between now and draft time, you know, if we find out he has a, I don't know, a UCL issue or, you know, something a pitcher would have, and, you know, unless there's something structural we don't know about, uh, that he looks, he's got all those, the tools, he's got the coaching, he's ready to go. So I'll say, so I'll say a couple things. This guy played a different position, but Anthony Poindexter was looked at as a, when he was at UVA, uh, which would have been, you know, 20 years ago, 1998 when he came out. Uh, he was looked at as a, a, a his, after his junior season, he would have been a top 10 pick in the first round of the draft. So had to come back for his senior season, uh, got hurt in game eight. Uh, he still got drafted, seventh round. He played literally special teams a few games, over, over scattered over two seasons. In my, in my opinion, all, of all the UVA football players I've covered, seen, talked to, etc., which dates back to I guess probably the mid to late 80s, over 30 years. And they've had some guys. They've had Tiki Barber, Rondé Barber. Rondé Barber is, looking, is being looked at as a Hall of Fame guy. Uh, you know, all the uh, 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 Jamie Sharper, James Ferrier, uh, Thomas Jones, um, you know, Herman Moore. Uh, and, and I'm leaving a lot of guys out. Those are the top guys. Of all those guys, when they were in college, Poindexter was head and shoulders above those others. He played parts of two seasons in the NFL on special teams because he got hurt his senior season. So when I hear a guy's thinking, hey, I, I should go out – uh, and, and go to the NFL. Go. Because every football player is a play away from being an ex-football player. And so, you know, it's hard. it would be hard for me to say, don't take that chance if it's out there for you. And then I'll look it up, too. And Jones is actually a redshirt, redshirt junior. So I presume, uh, being a Duke young man, that he is ready to graduate. Because he's a redshirt junior, it means he's been there four years. I would, I would assume that that he's a few credits away from, from getting that degree. So it's not like you're talking about, hey, you're leaving school a year early. You still got to finish school. No, he'll finish school uh, and get a chance to be an NFL player. And you know what? Take it. Take it, young man. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm just saying this because every time I look at a guy like that now, I'm thinking Anthony Poindexter, who was the best football player I ever saw at the college level, and he never got to do it in the NFL. And so I, I always lean towards – Take your chance. This is this is what you've been working for. You can a, after your career's over, then you can go back and do what you need to do with the rest of your life. And there is a rest of your life. Well, if you play in the NFL and, and, and like Tom Brady until you're forty something, you still have a rest of your life after this. But take this chance now. Yeah, absolutely. From what's in his best interest, I, I agree completely. And that, that's why when I say I started the statement of saying selfishly, I wish you would stay. And, and the thing about the football, and I get the football players' issues. I, I mean, I'm a football player. I, I would like to figure out what the NBA understands that we don't. The football player's career is so much shorter. And you are one play away from not being able to play anymore. And you're in a situation to where my biggest concern is that he comes back and plays quarterback at Duke for another year. And let's you go out and get three or four 300-pound linemen, which we're all going to go to Clemson or Georgia or Alabama, he's, he's risking his health. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thing there on the games where he really shined. He, he had some pretty impressive games. I, the pick game, that's as well as Daniel Jones can play. And he goes out and he puts up 49 points. And, you know, Chris, when you put up 49 points in a college football game, you expect to do what? Mm-hmm. Win. You know, it's, just, it's hard to think about playing that well, but it's you know it, it's funny is that uh, Connor Vernon. I don't know how much that name uh, rings a bell for you. Well, but when you. Connor Vernon, yeah, you know, when he graduated from Duke a few years ago, he was the all-time leading receiver in the ACC. 
in the ACC, not, not at Duke, but in the ACC. This year, man, didn't get drafted. We went down to the Senior Bowl and watched him play. He didn't get drafted. He signed as a free agent, and he never, he never made it in the NFL. This is only, what, three or four years ago. You're, so you're in a situation where here's somebody who caught more balls for more yards. You think about all the people that have played wide out in the ACC. Then you go and you take a look at somebody who doesn't have the, 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 the body to play in the NFL. That's the, the, the tough thing. Most of the time, with basketball, it's easier to tell. You can look at the uh, uh, DeAndre Hunter and say, he's going to play at the next level. Okay? Now let's take a look at your uh, a couple of other players on the UBA team, on the basketball team. They're solid players. They're fundamentally sound. They say they can shoot. But can you guarantee me they're going to get to play at the next level? If you can. So if you have an opportunity, uh, Justin Anderson, I think, was a great example. I When he left, I'm just going, so he's got a chance to pursue an opportunity. It, it makes sense. So from Joe's standpoint, it, it, makes, it would make sense for him to go. He has been there. Uh, he's already been there for four years. And I, the last couple of games, watching him try to play through his injury was uh, – he was very touchy, but he just, if you go back and see any clips of the Clemson game, and look how much tape is on his ankle, I'm just sitting out there the whole game, I'm just going, man, I hope they don't break something on me. So, if he does, I, I think he has that talent. I think he's going to be somebody who will be even better uh, when he has an offensive line that can protect him. Well, and, you know, if you're Duke, you uh, have the spring to get your next guy ready, and I assume Cutcliffe recruits good quarterback. I don't know who's next in the pipeline there, but, but I would assume he's got somebody ready to go, and, and uh, you know, that, that'll, it'll start the post-Daniel Jones era. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, but I, I always lean on the side of, yeah, if it's legitimate. There was a kid at Tech, Virginia Tech a couple years ago, and I can't think of his name now. That tells you that it's, it's, a, it's an afterthought, but the first quarterback in the uh, Justin Fuente era uh, had a good season at Tech, and then he decided to, declared for the draft, and people looked up and, and wondered why, because he had a good season at Tech, but uh, he was not on anybody's draft board. He didn't get drafted, and he was done. Once you declare your eligibility, is, you, is done, and, and, and he, you know, didn't have a chance to fall back. And So if you have a legitimate chance of making it, please, you know, take take stock and make sure you have a you know, some good advice and that kind of thing, but but if you're Daniel Jones and you're looking at the first-round pick, you know, it's tough. It's it's tough to overlook. Plus, again, he's 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 on pace to get his degree, so that's that's a good thing too. He's, it's not like he's he's throwing that opportunity away. And you know, even if he wasn't, let's be, he, he got into Duke. He, he he's got to be smart enough to be able to go back afterwards and finish up what he had to finish up. But uh, uh, I'm kind of thinking through what else we can get into here, Jerry. Uh, your thoughts on uh, real quick, I guess your thoughts on Duke bowl matchup. Uh, uh, you know your 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 first impression at least. I know we've got some time to figure out. Cause I've got to also. I haven't even looked at South Carolina yet, except for a cursory glance. But uh, your thoughts on Duke's ball game coming up? Uh, it's going to be an interesting one. We did. Uh, it should be warm, or if it's not warm, then no place is going to be warm. It's a it's a dangerous kind of matchup, if you will, Chris, because they're playing Temple, and the average football fan doesn't. Now, when you think all about Temple football, now I believe that the Temple coach could very well be the guy that ends up with the Georgia Tech job now. Exactly, that's what, yeah, but, that's the dude, yeah. So this guy has a very solid program. He does things the right way. They went eight and four, and they are uh, coming in with some momentum, and they're in the situation where they're going to have a chance to play a quote unquote power five team. It, it's a situation, uh, as far as which game am I more excited to watch, I, I, I'm anxious to see how Virginia's going to match up against South Carolina because the SEC, the poundage of normally of the SEC team's offensive line and defensive line is just scary. And now Clemson has a similar line, but I'm very, I'm very excited to, well, I won't be down in Charlotte in person, but I'll definitely be watching that to see how uh, South Carolina can try to deal with trying to, sh to shut down Perkins. Yeah, and what I'm seeing is uh, South Carolina puts points on the board. 
they 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 scored 35 on Clemson, and it wasn't a fluky 35. It was uh, you know there were people Clemson fans were upset that their defense gave up 35, and Dabo Swinney put a quick end to that. That's a good South Carolina team offensively. Defensively, from what I'm reading, and I, again, I'll have to study it more closely, but apparently they've had some real issues with injuries on the defensive side of the ball, and apparently those guys are th- those injuries were season-ending nature for a few key guys in the secondary particularly, so they're vulnerable to the pass game. Uh, I'll kind of break down X and O's a little bit more as we get closer to that game. It's still a few weeks away, but uh, it, it would seem to me, at least at first glance, the kind of game that could be very exciting for fans. You watch it on TV if you're in the stadium. It could be the kind of game that you know, ends up being a pretty high-scoring game. Uh, I like Virginia's defense. I mean, I know if Clemson can't can't hold South Carolina to under 35, it's going to be tough for Virginia to do so as well. But I do like Virginia's defense just just very generally. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think that, you know, it, 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 could, it could be the kind of game that comes down to who is better protecting the ball uh, and who maybe just gets one or two stops in this game. Uh, maybe kind of playing out a little bit like that Virginia Tech game for Virginia – where it came down to, you know, play calling at the end and uh, a player or two going one way or the other kind of determines the game. It could, it feels like it could be that kind of game. Uh, and, and for Virginia, if they're able to play play for play with an SEC school, I know South Carolina's a middle of the pack SEC school right now, but if Virginia is able to play with them, uh, that can that can be positive momentum going into next year. Yeah, absolutely. I think that. Uh, the, 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 Temple Duke game, I think, is also going to be a little bit of a shootout. But I think that Virginia can use this as a, as a continuing building block going forward. You win the game, Chris. You're eight and five over six and seven. That's number one. Number two, yeah, you know, we're trying to recruit after the game against Navy was difficult. You go in there. I don't even know that you have to win the game. Obviously, you want to win the game. But more importantly, you don't want to lose by three touchdowns. And Virginia is in a situation to where I think that I, I do believe that Blocks are going to get it done long term. But my definition of done is different than everybody else's. I, I, I think if he could come in there and coach that team to be 8 and 4 or 9 and 3 in this league, that he's done his job. And, I, you know, again, if you, if you find a way to win the game, you, you're in there 8 and 5. That's two, a, a full two-game improvement over six and seven, and your last game is a is a great great memory. So the one thing I, I will say, I think Dabo's quotes after the uh, the South Carolina game I thought were really interesting, and they sounded very very similar to Coach K's quotes the same week. And Dabo actually said he goes, if going twelve and zero isn't good enough. I don't know what to do for these people. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he, and he, he, was, he was a little bit more clever in saying it, but he actually suggested that fans might need to go find somebody else to pull for if you haven't done enough. And, you know, Coach Kane was in the same situation um, of just saying, hey, can we just relax with all the hype? Can we just let these young 19-year-old kids be 19-year-old kids? And it's a different comparison, but talking about the expectations for Tony and uh, and UVA. If UVA plays the game now and doesn't hold their opponent under 50, there are people saying, what's wrong with their defense? But ask yourself this. Go back five years, six years, seven years. Who in college basketball is holding somebody under 50 points? Well, and, you know, we okay. might hear- we might hear it this weekend, Jerry. Uh, UVA's got a home game with VCU. Now, you know, VCU, for the national fans, you'll say, oh, yeah, that's the name brand team. That's Chaka Smart's group, right? Well, the last couple of years have been down years since Smart left, but this team's coming back. 7-2 and two record, and they beat Texas in Austin. Texas coached by, yes, you guessed it, Chaka Smart. So uh, Virginia's got them and uh, got, got VCU in, in what's the last game before Virginia's exam break on Sunday. And, uh, you know, Virginia should win that game. They'll be favored to win that game. But VCU is going to give them that, uh, that, that best shot they've got. It's, it's a, you know, from an NCAA tournament standpoint, if you're, if you're VCU and you're looking at your at-large resume, you're trying to build it, you beat Virginia in JPJ. And, you know, all you got to do then is play decently in the A-10. You're going to be in the NCAA tournament. If you get that win on Virginia's home floor, 
So you're going to get VCU's best effort. Now, if you're a Virginia fan, uh, just like Clemson football fans, just like Alabama football fans, like Duke basketball fans, if you're a Virginia fan and you just you don't care that VCU just played their best game of the season and you know they beat a team that beat Carolina a couple weeks ago and all this kind of stuff, all you know is your team was lost to VCU. You're going to be on the message boards upset at Tony Bennett. Hey, we need to change the offense. He needs to change the defense. He needs to put different players in the game. Fans do that though, and I, you know, Jerry, I was going to. It's a good way to wrap this show up because fans annoy me. I'm a fan. You're a fan, so we're both fans. Uh, and I don't, I don't annoy myself, and we don't annoy each other. But fans in general, the Clemson fans who are upset because you only beat South Carolina 56-35, the Duke fans who are upset that. You only beat Indiana by 30 or whatever it was in the Big Ten Challenge game. Uh, UVA football fans who are upset because this team only went 7-5. and five. They blew those last two games against Georgia Tech and Virginia Tech. We need to fire the offensive coordinator because he's awful. We don't enjoy it enough. We got to, you know, I, I, maybe some people think part of enjoying it is yelling about who their favorite team is, who they should fire. Why don't we just enjoy it more? Why don't we just watch the game, have fun with it, root for our team? If we win, great, yay. If we lose, man, you know, get them next time. We don't do that anymore. If, if we lose, people need to be fired. The university president needs to be fired. The coach needs to be fired. The ticket taker needs to be fired. What, what is it about us that we've gotten to this point in society? Well, I'll share with you my favorite story on that note. I, I, I understand I'm in the... Uh, I'm not in the norm in the, as far as my level of definition of what a fan is, but uh, one of my great memories was uh, we're coming out of uh, um, the Dome in Atlanta, and Duke had played uh, Johnny Manziel in Texas A&M, and this was uh, it was a situation to where for for 30 minutes we were running Texas A&M out of the building. Now, it, was, it was unbelievable how bad we're beating them. Texas A&M comes back and uh, wins the game at the end. And uh, Boone um, we could have won the game for us. We got picked off in the end zone. We lose the game 52 to 49. It was arguably the greatest game football wise I've seen in person, as far as just sheer pleasure in watching and enjoyment in the in the process. So we're going through this, walk out the building, and uh, one of the people there with me that night was like, "Son," oh. and He's, he's, he's sitting there just trying to console me. And I, I'm just I, I'm, I'm just trying not to laugh. I'm going, are you kidding me? I said, I got to go to Atlanta. I got to watch an incredible football game. There were 100 points scored. I was with friends and family. And I said, I had one of the greatest nights of my life. Do you really think that I'm upset that we didn't win the game? And then I realized that's how most people look at things. Most most people look at things. Well, if we don't win, then you're right. Let's tell you lose your job. Somebody somebody didn't do what they what they should do. Somebody has to be held accountable. And that's never been what sports was to me. Sports is in a situation to where it was always the fun of it. It was the, the, the love of the game, the beauty of the game. And, and you're in a situation now uh, uh I was sitting there this week, of course, uh, Duke was playing, uh, it was Hartford the other night, and uh, I was, we're watching the game, and I'm giving Lynn the rundown on how I think this game will play out, it, it, it almost played out spot on, but it was funny, in the game, because Duke had ended up with 12 bucks, 13 bucks, and one of them, I don't know if you saw the highlight or not, where... Zion steals the ball, and he's going in, and he looks like he's going to dunk the ball, and instead he flips it off the backboard. The bear catches it in the air and dunks it. And uh, it, was just, it was just fun. It was, it was just fun. It was a situation to where the uh, 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 Ellis was doing the game. There's a commentary. He goes, what are we, in Rucker Park now? And I'm sitting there, and I go, it's fun. It, it, the game is fun. The both the bowl games are fun. UVA playing against South Carolina is going to be fun. I hope UVA wins, but if UVA doesn't win, I, I hope they play well. But you're right. We live in a day and age where we want to we want to win every game, and if we don't win every game, then we want to hold we want to blame somebody. And I, I understand that again. I'm in the minority on that. 
I just want to be a fan. I want to cheer. I want to. I want to enjoy it. I want to see people play well. And I guess there's just a lot more of the other people than there are people like myself. Yeah, yeah. I look at it like it's in football season. There's a Saturday. Uh, get up, go to the game. Uh, you're gonna come home. Uh, why let your mood be determined by whether or not your team scored at least one more point than the other team? I, and it, maybe, maybe this for me is, from a football standpoint particularly, is you know a lot of bad years for EVA football and learning that, you know what, you can't let the mood of your day, much less the mood of your week, be determined by the result of a game you have no control over. I enjoy the games. And, and I've come to enjoy the games win or lose. And that's again, that's because EVA football lost a lot of games. And there was a time, too, where UVA basketball was, was you know, losing a lot of games. At the end of the day, Lato era, the first couple of years of the Tony Bennett era when he was trying to recover things. But, um, you know, and, and don't hold me to that uh, when UVA basketball loses in March. Uh, but even then, a day or two later, I'm, I'm, I'm recovered. I'm back to normal. And I, I enjoy every game. And part of the enjoying every game is being nervous about how the game is going uh, and you know, you want your team to win and that kind of thing. But, yeah, we don't need to fire everybody. We don't need to call everybody names. We don't need to question their loyalty. We don't need to question their manhood or womanhood in the case of women's sports. We just, you know, and it's not just that. I mean, it's it's also, you know, if you are a fan of a TV show, if you reduce yourself to looking online about people's thoughts on that TV show, people will question, well, why did the writers have this character do this, you know? Why couldn't they do this? Uh, I'm a professional wrestling fan. Same thing there. Why did Why did this guy do this? Why did this guy do that? Uh, politics, same thing. We just, you know, we're all experts now, and and it's it's all or nothing. And you know, uh, just if, if anything out of this podcast you get, just enjoy life a little bit more. Um, just enjoy it a little bit more. You know, that that's and Jerry and I enjoy it, so maybe we'll be good influences. <laughs> That was my, my lasting memory, just uh, following the, the storm. And I have two die, uh, diehard fan, fan affiliations for me, for Kelsey Plum and Brianna Stewart. And following the storm this year and watching the storm win the WNBA championship in just Dewey's third year. And you're going through this. And I had a blast. Got to go to the game, too, with it at our place. And kind of had a blast. And... Then the question has to get asked, okay? Somebody had to ask, first of all, Donald Trump wasn't going to invite the Seattle Storm to the White House, okay? It wasn't It wasn't going to happen. Yeah. But so, somebody had to ask. So Sue Bird goes, yeah, I don't think we're going to get asked, but if we did, we probably wouldn't go. And I'm going, why did that have to come up? Why did that have to be part of the celebration? Why, why did we have to, you know, it, it's a situation to where I don't know which president started the let's invite the teams thing. I thought it was a pretty phenomenal idea. You know? But it, it didn't. And I think people were looking forward to doing that. And now that's it. It just, again, that's the message. My message would be if you have a team or a player and, you know, or a school, just enjoy it. Enjoy the moment. Take the good with the bad. And, and we're talking about, you know, people talk about Cubs. You know, being a Cubs fan, because I've been a big football fan for 40 years, and I don't think a Cubs fan has a whole lot on me. But if it's a situation to where if you're passionate about something, pull, pull for good things to happen, enjoy the moment, and when you win, it's a bonus. Most fun I've ever had at a sporting event was not even a UVA sporting event. It was a Washington Nationals playoff game. Game 5, I think it was 2016. Uh, game five of the first round series. So that was the deciding game of that series. L.A. Dodgers versus Washington Nationals. Two very good teams. And day of the event, we just decided, Chris and I decided, we looked at tickets on StubHub. We got, you know, they were relatively inexpensive, I think 40 or 50 bucks each to sit in the bleachers in left field. And uh, we got, so we went on a spur of the moment, just went. And uh, game started around 7 Nobody sat as soon as the first from the oh, from the national anthem. Nobody sat until the game was over. I mean, and the game went. You know, it's funny. People complain about length of baseball games. They don't complain if you're if you're enjoying it though. Game went almost five hours, nine innings, almost five hours, and nobody sat. We didn't sit between innings. We didn't sit at all. It was that 
tense an atmosphere, but that enjoyable an atmosphere. And I remember the game was a close game. Uh, it was a, I think the Dodgers hit a home run in the uh, eighth inning to take a, a, a one-run lead. And Clayton Kershaw, who pitched the day before, walks down on the bullpen, which is in left field at Nats Park. So, uh, And I'm telling Crystal, oh, my God, Clayton Kershaw is coming to the bullpen. He's not walking down here to, to get exercise in. He's pitching the ninth inning. That's how much this game means. He's pitching the ninth inning. And he did. He pitched the ninth inning. And the Nats had a couple guys on. Daniel Murphy with two outs. Daniel Murphy batting against Clayton Kershaw. Strikes out game, or not? He, he may have grounded out game over, and my team lost. I'm a Nats fan, I'm a big Nats fan. My team lost. I still say that is the most fun I've ever had at a sporting event, and maybe the most fun I'll ever have at a sporting event. And my team lost. So, if you can grow to the point as a fan where you can say that that's the most fun you've ever had at a sporting event, you're probably well, you, I, I, I'd admire you. I think Jerry would admire you. We may be the only two people, Jerry, who would admire a person like that. But we're at least on your team. Uh, it, that's a great, great story that you told there, and mine was a similar one. I mean, I had followed the Canucks my whole life, and uh, I got to go to Boston Garden. Now, the one thing I had not ever done is NHL game was going to a Stanley Cup game. And when they, uh, who knew they would go 25 years in between getting there, went up there and uh, got to see an NHL Stanley Cup game in Boston. And came back, and uh, everybody that knew I went was acting all bummed because my team lost. And I, I'm just sitting there saying, I, I just I feel bad for those people. I if, if I had a book left to write, if I had a book left to write, I've even got it named. It's called Get Your Tickets. And I would put together a story uh, of, of how many different amazing sporting events. I've ended up at in person uh, over different different sporting venues, different scenarios, and I, I was sitting there and had seen a, a Stanley Cup game in Boston Garden was was insane. I think we ended up losing the game four to three. And I get back and I feel, oh man, I hate that you went all the way up there and they lost. I said, well, first of all, they didn't lose to the Taliban. <laughs> Yeah, I, it, 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 you know, it was it was Boston Bruins, and I said Dad was based in what's in Rhode Island, so I said we lived once in Boston. I said it was a great game, but there are there are a lot of people who believe that if you if you're going to go to a sporting event and your team doesn't win, that somehow it was a waste of time to go, and that just that sad me for those people. It does, yeah, because you're not. When you buy a ticket to a game, there's a 50-50 shot at, at least, right, that your team's going to lose. I mean, and ha uh, the ESPN uh, 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 and other people who put the odds out will tell you there's probably even a much different than 50-50 chance your team will win or lose based on analytics and everything else. But 50-50 chance your team's going to lose. Let's just leave it at that. And, you, again, you can't, you, can't, you can't base your your happiness on whether or not your team wins. So, anyway, uh, hopefully we've made that point. I think we have. And we have fun with this podcast. Hey, to, to wrap things up, you know, hopefully it's a better than 50-50 chance you have fun listening to it. So um, for Jerry, now we've got to, you know, we'll figure this out. We'll talk some, talk some more next week. We're getting closer to bowl season, so we'll talk more specifically about Duke and UVA's bowl game. We'll have more college basketball to talk about and uh, some other stuff too. But uh, Jerry, I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast yet again. Hey, last, uh, last little nugget. I'll make it a quick one. You talked about VCU just beat uh, Texas. There's a little thing the fans, the average fan might not know. VCU is always going to be a cradle for coaches to come in and then leave. Their program signed a deal where they let people go, but they have to come back and play a home and home with them. Yeah. yeah. So they, I, they, I, they've done that now for their last four coaching changes. I think it's pretty clever. And, they can actually go on the road and beat your former coach. It's pretty awesome. But, Chris, it's always a pleasure. I look forward to next week, and it'll be the kickoff of the bowl season. Look forward to it. Thanks for listening, and have a great day, everybody.